last year at Mount Abu, we have a conference on science through silence. In this conference, we had a discussion on neutrino. The power source somewhere is continuously giving the energy, maybe by neutrino. How do you harvest this tremendous energy? Professor Holger, Dr. Butker, and our team is now taking up challenge for the harvesting this energy. CIMET is a material research laboratory and will play a role in the developing of the materials for the neutrino energy capture or conversion. Good morning, everybody. For this entrancing webinar, we have four eminent speakers, Dr. Vijay Bhatkar, Dr. Holger, Dr. Ludwig, and Professor Vasant Voraskar. So we are today talking about the harvesting of neutrinos for humanity as a whole, for the world at large. So it's a very important seminar because there have not been many webinars on this issue, even worldwide. Neutrino science, but not neutrino science alone. We are talking about neutrino voltaic technology. This was the word uh, I was hearing first time from uh, Dr. Holger uh, when that, uh, what is neutrino voltaic? We know, of course, photovoltaic. Uh, and um, we don't know new, neutrino voltaic. I knew that, uh, that, that, that we are talking about technology harnessing energy harnessing electricity, voltaic means voltage. So coming from voltage, voltaic energy from neutrinos. So that is the that is the goal, overall goal into this whole thing. And I really like that word neutrino voltaic. By 2040 kind of paper which, which are coming out uh, is that the dominant part of the energy will come from uh, this photovoltaics. I think in India itself, we are building gigawatt uh, stations, we are building so many um, uh, farms we are being built for harnessing this power. Now, the, it is in this context we are looking for uh, learning what is the, uh, the contribution that will come from uh, neutrino and we are calling uh, neutrino voltaic technology as uh, Holger has uh, called to this, um, this one very appropriately. But it is not, it is going to be harnessing is going to be a different kind. It is not exactly the manner the photovoltaic technology has done. And uh, that is going to be a, a great innovation. It is in this context, I would say, that uh, when um, Dr. Holger and team demonstrated to us uh, something on the, through the video conferencing and that how it is harnessed, what are the materials involved. I think the why uh, when uh, we say that we these two teams should collaborate together, uh, then I approached Dr. Kai that that is a CMAT laboratory the Center for Materials for Electron, uh, Electronic Technology. CMET was a laboratory which was with for a lot of uh, far sighted it was built. Uh, no, Dr. Dinesh Amarnerko was involved. There are many of my colleagues who were involved. And uh, the, my lab, CRAC lab was involved at Euclid's Nurture in the beginning. And let's, um, so, and I see the CMET lab. And, I, and then suddenly started thinking that that if, if the CMET, which is also working on batteries, which are not electrical cars, and uh, the materials for that, and also on the storage issues, if uh, CMET gets involved in this whole process, I think that we can make a we can make a very uh, not only in detection and physics, we can make a great contribution uh, for harnessing this technology. And that's why we said, uh, Dr. Holger, let's have this uh, interactions. Let us sign the MOU. Let us collaborate together on this issue. And uh, I'm sure. With so many physicists, so many material scientists, so many people working uh, uh, from Germany and under Holger's team, and of course from India, I think, uh, which is uh, harnessing is a totally new subject for us. I think in the thing, how, how do we do that? And if we collaborate, we have some early, uh, we have some breakthroughs uh, on, on this. And some people are very, I think, very far sighted. They see this impact. They see this impact, this, they see the opportunity, they see the technology, and that they are, once the technology comes, the whole breakthrough happens. What has happened like 150 years back when electricity came, and then we see the whole world was lit up with light, I think, and then everything happened around this. So we are seeing uh, what I wanted to bring to, 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 to four or to which all of you know, that this has a potential of that kind. Uh, this is a potential of that kind. We are talking about it. We are pioneering it. 
in the sense that we are imagining, um, I was saying, imagining that there will be tomorrow's cars, tomorrow's mo not only mobiles, but tomorrow's vehicles will be powered by this. I'm very happy that uh, we all come together for a collaboration, for working this kind of thing, and making initial breakthroughs. And, um, and you know, once, the, once a breakthrough is made, and once the, I think uh, the whole world can change. This was what Einstein said. And I think there is Einstein, by giving the equation E is equal to mc square, by giving the photoelectric effect to the world, he gave the photoelectric effect and of course, uh, the, so we have seen more the impact of photoelectric effect, uh, so the world changed. So today we are talking uh, a breakthrough of that kind. It will take some time, it will take a lot of uh, things, but the, uh, in the collaboration, uh, understanding, talking about uh, neutrino voltaic as a technology. As a technology, I'm not talking about the effects were known, are known on so many years. But looking at a commercially viable technology which can pervade the entire world, humanity, is a great, I think, great imagination. And it can be done. And uh, we are seeing some of the initial uh, realizations of that. And I wish the entire team, I think whole team, who are investigating this, this breakthrough technology, which will bring a new hope for the humanity. Today, we are now discussing a very special issue. For over 10 years, I have been working on, on it every day, and it has taken a while to get to the mainstream. Today, we have the recognition that we have access to the limited cosmic energy, and that is exactly what humanity needs to continue. And I want to say my very special thanks uh, to Dr. Batkar to make uh, the thing so clear at the beginning because this is very important. Um, we are talking not about a dream. We're talking about hard technical and physical facts. And we are now called upon to use these findings and translate it into touchy technologies. And this, therefore, it was very, very important not to come in any conflict with the basic researchers for the neutrino research, which are working with the detectors and working with the accelerators, so that we make it very clear, neutrino energy is not the neutrino's energy only. So neutrino energy means the invisible spectrum of radiation, which we want to use into, for practical things. And um, I will tell you, I, I will come a little bit back to the roots of the technology and uh, you will totally understand why I'm uh, today also speaking to the Indian audience and why, why I like to come with this technology uh, to India. And I'm very, very happy that we have this collaboration with CMET because I think we need the best knowledge and we need very awake and creative individuals which are using this knowledge and take this knowledge to change it, to really translate it into the touchy technologies because this is important for the people uh, that they can have something uh, in, inside their hands uh, for practical use. I like to go a little bit back to the time when I have started with this topic, because you have to understand how I, how, how I come to neutrino, neutrino energy, neutrino voltaic. I am trained as a mathematician and a business manager. This was my business at the beginning of the 1990s. I was very successful and all the money, what I made at that time, finally I invested later in the research. My father was a nuclear physicist and my mother, was a chem she was a chemist. So science thinking has been one of my habits since I was in the children's shoes. 
And my brother and me was always asking what, what we can do when we see things, how we can improve it. And my father, he also was involved in the beginning of the photovoltaics. And when, when he came to one home, he was traveling around the world and constructing this nuclear uh, power stations. And but he came to one home from the US. I was, I can't remember, 10 or 11 years old. And he was uh, bringing the first solar cell, photovoltaic cell. And he explained that it's possible to use the light to make energy on it. And it, I, I, it's, I, I can remember I was going to school the next day and I was telling my teacher that I am able, that we are able, my father is able to use the light to make electricity. And they said, this is impossible, totally impossible. But I saw it, I, I, we were able to see it. But from this moment, it cost a couple of years to see this, tele, this technology is the first time in action. In action means for me, it was in the calculators of the Texas Instruments at that time, the first solar cell and it doesn't need a battery. And uh, this was for me something, even as a child to try to think about it and to know more. But uh, after the university, I, I, I came to the real estate and I was CEO of a big German real estate company, but I never lost the sight to, to this kind of technologies. And I always was thinking about how maybe can we this kind of solar technology better and that this happened. So the solar technology started to come in the daily in the daily uh, room of the people, in the houses, in the little gadget, and the solar came. But even today, solar is just a part. What I want to explain is that the global system of energy supply today is built on the idea of central production. So when, when we talk about neutrino voltaic, we have a different point of view. We are having only weak, weak force and weak energy. But as a, as a mathematician, I can tell you, the sum of all this weak energy is much larger, much larger than all big power, all these big things around the world. This, and all this system as we have today, we doesn't want to speak badly because this system was born more than over 100 years ago and it was useful at the moment in, in the time of early industrialization. But today we come to the, I, I will use a hard word, to a abyss. We come to abyss. This is a question and the point of view because today we see all the negative influence of, of them. And especially in India, I, I saw in the television all the smog what you have, you can't breathe, the air is polluted by the climate. Uh, maybe this is, we have a climate change man-made or not, this is not a question today, but we know all this kind of pollution is, this is very bad. So we, we, we have to find something new. Otherwise the efforts are coming closer to many reasons very quickly. The key to change something is the knowledge. And the knowledge comes, comes to me at around 2008. I, I was continuing the research of the photovoltaics. And the one professor in Switzerland, he made particles smaller to have a larger surfaces to increase the power of the solar cells. But when he made it too small, he found vibrations. And these vibrations were not useful for the photovoltaics. And there is a very nice study of a technical high school of Zurich. And this is a little bit one of the basics of this thing, what we are doing now in uh, neutrino voltaics. 
atomic vibration in nanomaterials and nanocrystals. So this is an, this findings were very, very important, especially that soft surfaces vibrate strongly and the soft surface, what we are using is this graphene between two layers of silicium. The patent, what we have is the patent for a graphene sandwich. And why this is so important? Two things are necessary to use the technology. First, we have to know that in the vacuum, there's some energy inside. And as we have learned by Dr. Batcaso, thank you very much again. There's a lot of things inside. But the problem for man is that if you can't see something, you do not believe that there are something is inside. And so in the research, it was a very important point when the neutrino was not only was postulated when the neutrino had a clear mass and because if something has a clear mass, it also will have energy. And today we have uh, um, that one single neutrino, we even know exactly that one single neutrino have something around one, one electron volt. This is just a very little amount of, of energy, but we have billions and we have it not only, we, we don't only have the solar neutrinos, we have cosmic neutrinos and many other things. And as we have learned, we not only have the neutrinos, we have a lot of other things and electromagnetic radiation. And the second thing is when you see how electricity will produce even in the nuclear power plants by magnet, so you understand and they have, this system is a system of huge production of huge amounts of energy by AC, but the AC is only needed for the transportation. So the AC is only for these people which have to transport energy by thousands and um, thousands of kilometers by 380,000 volt. But all this electrical little gadget what we use today are very uh, doesn't need the AC and uh, so we we have to find sorry a way to have the energy the electrical energy everywhere and there we need there we need um, a, a clear technology and this is the it's a mechanical thing, but it's a quantum mechanical thing. So we have now a quantum mechanical technology that we are able to convert the energy from the neutrinos and the other electromagnetic waves into electricity. And what we want to do within the next years to, to implant this technology in any really in any electrical device. And I tell you the, the story by the Pi car, because then you can imagine when, when, when you think about a car, you can imagine this car, this frame of the car can also be the cube at home or a little cube in any electrical device. And the story, what I will tell you now, is a very special story and I, I never told it before because this is something totally new. I have a very special paper here and I will give you some citations. This special paper is from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. This paper was a hidden paper, it was not open published yet. This paper is the study for potential of harvesting solar neutrinos to power electrical cars. Something around one and a half year ago from a very large German manufacturer, I will not tell the name yet, this, um, the chief engineering officer was sending me 
was sending me an email. I was very surprised to see that. And I, I called him back and he said to me, oh, Mr. Schubert, we were looking about that, what you have published, and I, we want to have a meeting with you. Okay, I, I had a meeting with him. He came to our office uh, to Berlin and he told me that they were looking about that we are doing and uh, they, have, they have some conflicts with the, with the basic researchers because neutrinos are so weak and doesn't interact and so on. And he, want to know, he wanted to know a little bit more about that, what we are doing. And I explained him, I showed him, I demonstrated him. And we also made some NDAs and uh, he was involved and then it was silence. Um, two weeks later, he came back and he said, ah, oh, Mr. Schubert, I have talked to my uh, board of directors and uh, at this moment, we can't work with you. And I asked him, yeah, why? Why? Ah, it's very simple. And maybe we believe in the technology, but uh, our company has invested uh, something around 30 billion in uh, technology of uh, charging electrical cars and we have the next models coming up to the market uh, now in 2020 and 2021 and we, we have so much money invested that this disruptive technology is, you know you maybe come back in a couple of years and then it was silence and they, it doesn't do anything and uh, even in uh, german press you know the people are this is very difficult to have this topic on the, on the mainstream but we will continue our things and uh, now, first time, <laughs> I will let you know a little bit about this study because this is very, very interesting. And I, I know now that we are really on the right way and we are really on the right way to do it in India. And this, uh, so this disruptive technology will come now from India and not from Germany. They had to have the chance, but they, they are not grasping that. This study of the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and you have to know that the Royal Academy in Stockholm, this is the same university which are responsible for the Nobel Prize in Physics 2015, um, to give uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics to, uh, to scientists to prove that the neutrinos have mass. And I, I think that this big car manufacturer especially used that. Uh, institute in Stockholm because they wanted to know it clearly. So I, I was very much surprised by this, this study came to me by an intelligence service officer from, from Switzerland. He <laughs> arranged it for me. And they have a lot of questions inside the study. So the study was a demand of sustainable mobility, neutrinos about astronomical carriers of energy, and uh, of course, all that, what, uh, what Dr. Batkar said at the beginning, uh, the uh, detector technologies, this, uh, all this historical research, all that, what was done, everything, what we know. And they wanted to find out if there is a possibility that these astronomical carriers of energy are, if it's possible, to use this kind of energy to power electrical cars. And they really make it, this study shows it about solar neutrinos. This is especially with the solar neutrinos, they are not using the other neutrinos, but they calculated exactly and everything what, what uh, have to be found out. All the state of the art of solar neutrino technology, solar neutrino detectors, uh, that, that we know with the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology that we have this one of electron volt for each, elect, uh, for each uh, neutrino, that we have 60 billion a second, and that we have a part of this uh, will be uh, coming to an um, interaction, that we have this water Sherenko technique uh, and the super Kamiokites and uh, all the other kind of detectors and uh, the boron experiments and the and then and they come, and this is very special, they come to my, to our, um, to our patent. And the question was the solar neutrino energy converter and the converter about this patent, what was published, and they created, they created this foil in a lab. 
They made really 12 uh, alter alternating silicon graphene layers on it, as exactly as I prescribed. And they calculated and tested and they measured. <laughs> and uh, they come finally, they come finally to the, and they have on the other side, they had the energy need of electrical vehicles and they give an estimation of the energy which is needed to be harvested from the solar neutrinos. And they found out that they need for a car of a length of four meters 76 and a weight of 188 with a leading surface, they write a leading surface, the total surface of the car, it's nearly 10 square meter. And they wanted to have uh, 80 kilowatt to have a range of around 300 kilometers. And they, they calculated, they calculated and they say, okay. And now I tell you what is really special. They found out that we have, so we had a little bit more at this first, we have the neutrino flux, the energy flux obtaining from the different solar neutrinos, only the solar neutrinos is listed as 19.49 watt square meters. So, and then they calculated, they tested, they measured, they, they, find, they find it and they said, oh, the problem is the surface exceeds the surface of the car, which is below of 10 square meters, maybe therefore this is too small. So we have only 10 square meters and we have 19.49 watts so with 190 watts. But this was the wrong conclusion because as we have learned, we can stable it. And when we have not one layer, because the big advantage of the photovoltaic cells is, uh, of the neutrino cells, um, the opposite of the photovoltaic cells, we can stable it, we can stack it. I don't know how many, we, we doesn't test more than a hundred yet. Maybe we have, we can do it with 200, with 500, whatever. So what they said, okay, we have 10 square meters, we have a 19.49 watt square meter, so 190 watt only, it's not sufficient enough. Have we 10, lines of that. And this is exactly what we want to do now in, with CMAP. We want to make this frame of the car in totally made of this material. And then we have, for example, when we have 10 layers of this, this materials, we will have 1,900 watt. At 50, it's around 10,000 watt. And when they write, they need eight kilowatt, then exactly that what the car need to be charged in the 10 hours. But the advantage is that our car is only parking on the road without using any kind of cable. And we does not only have the neutrinos, we maybe have a lot of more. And now when we, when we come from a normal car, as we know, with an engine to an electrical car. Everybody knows, especially in, in your area, in India, as hot the frame of the car becomes when the sun is shining. But these are not the photons, this is the electromagnetic wave. And the car is so hot, and all this energy inside the car you, you start the engine, you open the windows, you start the air condition, you destroy the energy. So inside the frame, inside the body of the car is so much energy. And this is exactly the energy what we will, what we will convert into range. And, and, and as, I, as I were saying at the beginning, this technology, when you close the eyes and see the car and you understand why this car is able to go without uh, to be loaded by a, by a cable, you can imagine that this will work in any other size too. So because we can do the same like the people of the photovoltaic do, we can, we can scale it. We, can, we have the advantage, we also can stable it. And after the Royal Academy of Science made the study, it, it's very important. Not we, we made the study, they made the study. I, 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 was, I 
before the study arrived, I was anyway sure that it works because we measure it in our own labs. But now they have approved it. And I also expect, like uh, Dr. Batkar said, that when this kind of knowledge will come mainstream, very, very quickly, very quickly, this technology will become disruptive. But we, we should not make, this is not a bad way of a disruptive technology. This is really a good way of a disruptive technology because the energy needs are growing and growing. And by using the energy which are around us, the neutrinos are part of that. We, we have with this uh, neutrino will take the first time really after the photovoltaic uh, a technology was and the technology where we were we able to, to use it as a technology which will really help, would help all of us in the future. And I really, uh, today I doesn't want to take too many things about the details of the technology, about how it works exactly. But just a few words is that the meta materials, so the, um, the vibration of the graphene between the silicium layers, this quantum mechanical effect, this is something where everybody, everybody, everybody of the audience is able to double check it. So if anybody will tell you in the future, our neutrinos are too weak. Yes, a single neutrino is weak. But we have today a technology to convert the invisible spectrum of radiation into electrical power. And I finally have a call to everybody who understand what I said today. Without any doubt, we know that we have enough invisible spectra of energy, not only enough, really a lot. Without any doubt, we know today how to convert a part of it into electrical power by quantum mechanical technologies in neutrino world tech. We know it. We know what we have to know to let it happen. And it's simply our duty to use that knowledge now to make life on this planet better. Not only for ourselves, we should do it for peace and we should do it for freedom. We should do it for our children and we should do it for the future generations. So thank you very much that you're listening to me and uh, hopefully I will have shortly the possibility to tell you more about that. So thank you very much. Energy technology is, um, it started many years ago. Um, one of my heroes of, of that scene is Nikola Tesla because um, he's not, he didn't just invent the, um, the AC current that we all use and all the electricity, but he built, he researched a lot in his, uh, like from 1900 to 1930, he researched, found, um, found a way to harness energy from um, the environment. And his vision was that um, we will connect to nature and um, he was very sure and he demonstrated it. And um, he was way ahead of his time. And not only did he detect um, vibrations in the earth's atmosphere that were named and detected later as Schumann resonances 50 years later. But he also talked about particles that 
from our point today, most likely are neutrinos. So an important point for me to make as a expert in this field is that it is a very promising technology because they, they actually demonstrated it, that it works. Plus they uh, give a lot of uh, information on how it works. So I want to pick two parts on the physics uh, around how this foil most likely will work. So first the connection to the neutrinos. So there is a paper from, uh, from China from uh, a researcher called Wang and he published on graphene, neutrino mass and oscillations. So we just heard in the previous talk that the neutrinos oscillate between the three different types. So in a similar way, if you have different graphene layers, these graphene layers interact with each, other, with each other in a very similar way or in the same way as the neutrinos oscillate. So if you read the paper from uh, Zhong Yu Wang, you will, you will see how that interaction will actually work. And so, um, here I see, and, um, and as far as I know, this is part of the reason why the whole foil is called neutrino energy foil because of this connection that the neutrinos interact and oscillate into the, and with the graphene layer. Now, the other maybe even more interesting uh, part on on this uh, graphene is uh, is the, the the sandwich between the silicon, the the two silicon layers and the graphene layer. So, um, as an example, um, the University of Arkansas, the and the researcher, which I have nice pictures from, but you can go on the internet and look at them. So Paul Tihabo from, from the University of Arkansas, he, he demonstrated as others um, that the graphene um, in the silicon sandwich starts to oscillate. So Holger also explained that this is part of the harnessing process. So the radiation, the neutrinos and, and other energies around, for example, ambient heat, most likely, they make the graphene oscillate and this oscillation can be converted into electron flow, meaning current. So this oscillation, which several researchers have discovered and studied and are studying, this leads to the um, the current of the in from the neutrino foil. Now, as I hope we in this whole research uh, will come come further, is there's a lot of possibilities on the material side, on this uh, meta material side, like the doping, the combination exactly on how the graphene is treated and the silicon, as we know from semiconductors is uh, also very important how you dope it. So, and if you think how far we went from the first uh, silicon, um, first silicon um, um, transistor is, um, and now we are at the um, computer level, computer chips, much more sophisticated. So 
if you look at the neutrino device and it's demonstrated, it's more on the level of the first transistor with gross materials connected and, but it worked and it showed the principle. So the same here on the material side, there's a lot of po possibilities. Now, one thing I hope is that more foil comes out so we can make more um, experiments with them. On the scientific side, like I said, the materials are important and there's a big field on, on the materials, but also on the fundamental question, where does the energy exactly come from, usually is helpful in enhancing the effect if you know exactly what's going on. So here we also need more foil because on the efficiency side, if you can have more power, then it will be more easy to detect where is this power actually coming from. So what part of the radiation or ambient heat or neutrinos, what is exactly giving out the power? If we have like a watt or two watts, then it's quite easy. You can, uh, you can use um, um, easy to build, but sophisticated uh, calorimetry to see how much ambient heat is going in. You can see the radiation parts, you can exclude certain vibrations and not the neutrinos, they just flow through. So as a scientist, of course, that's always interesting, but I think also for developing the whole process, it's helpful um, to see what exactly is going on. But first we need more, more foil to actually build larger devices to answer these questions. I, I think that um, this promising technology, if it, if it is in many things, for example, a mobile phone, obviously, as Professor Batka said, it's everybody will have one, everyone will carry one around. So if it will be powered by a little neutrino foil module, then it will be a new age. I mean, it will be everybody will know that this technology works, that if we have the neutrino foil, um, that will also become apparent that it might work differently for different people or in different environments, in different mental environments. Like in peace, it might give more energy than in a very harsh environment. And I know also that Holger is very much for applying these new technologies for peaceful applications. So yes, there is a subtle effect of thoughts on matter, but there's also a very gross effect on how we use things. And I think if we have access to new large amounts of energy, it's even more important than it is used, that it will be used for peaceful applications and not for weapons and tanks and all of this. But, and that is also a question of consciousness among us that we create a peaceful environment and that peace emanates through everything and that we protect this nice new development that will be used for peaceful applications. Well, I would like to thank Dr. Bharat Kale, Director Simit, inviting me <clears throat> to give a talk on basic aspects of neutrinos. So I really appreciate that this kind of webinar is being conducted, as uh, Dr. Barkar already said, first time in the country, to have really useful applications of neutrino in future, as Dr. Barkar has already explained very nicely. I am really impressed by the talk by Dr. Bhatkar, where he has explained very nicely the present application of neutrino and the status of the research of neutrino in our country. Now, the Dr. Olnagar has already explained the practical applications of neutrino. He has already demonstrated in his laboratory which I think in India were not yet done to the best of my knowledge, but it's with the expertise of CIMET, 
we are very hopeful that in near future we'll also have a device working on neutron my special thanks and deep gratitude to our beloved and divine sister brahma kumari gudi didi who always remain us and shower her spiritual blessings on all of us without her spiritual inspiration and support it would not be possible to get the desired progress in our research and organizing this webinar